Well, good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome everyone to our January 18th, uh, 2021 uh, weekly briefing on behalf of the great city of Richmond. We will begin today with a, a public health update. Here are the COVID-19 numbers for the city of Richmond uh, as of today, according to the Department of Health. The city of Richmond has seen 37,300 positive cases of COVID-19 since the beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020. Our seven-day average of new daily cases is roughly 357. You may recall our, our case count last week was north of 200, so you're seeing an increase there. And per our custom, I'd like to take a moment of silence in remembrance of those we've lost to COVID-19 over the course of this pandemic. 394 Richmonders lost to COVID-19. Thank you. So as we are continuing to climb uh, this current peak of COVID cases, there are a couple of things I want uh, us to uh, consider today. First, uh, the city continues to be under an internal mask mandate here at the city of Richmond. That means city employees and city buildings must wear their masks. That means those who visit city buildings must continue to wear that mask. Uh, so if you're uh, plan on making a visit to one of our uh, facilities, please come wearing your mask and understand that uh, this is about your care and the care of the public employees who work for the city of Richmond. This is our best protection against the Omicron variant as well. So we ask that you also get up to date on your vaccinations too. So per recent CDC guidance, it's been, if it's been two months, since your Johnson & Johnson, your J&J &J shot, or five months since your Pfizer or Moderna shot, we ask that you go out there and get boosted. Two months from the J&J, &J, five months from Moderna and Pfizer. If you've done the primary series, next step is to go out there and get boosted. Now, youth ages 12 and up can now get the Pfizer booster as well. And remember, the health district is taking appointments and walk-ins for youth vaccinations and boosters. So spread the word to your families in your circle to go out and get your kids vaccinated as quickly as possible. And as always, you can learn about your vaccination opportunities at vax, that's V-A-X dot R-C-H-D dot com or by calling the health hotline at 804-205-3501, okay? Now, here are some uh, of the, uh, some of the events that are offering uh, vaccinations this week through uh, the Richmond and Henrico Health District. Uh, for walk-up vaccine clinics, please remember you should visit the vdh.virginia.gov website uh, and scroll down and find what's going on here in Richmond. Uh, there are, remember these sites uh, are offering opportunities daily. Uh, from 8 to 6 p.m., um, besides Sundays, excluding Sundays, we are offering opportunities at the Arthur Ashe Athletic Center off of Arthur Ashe Boulevard. There will be opportunities like the, the clinics today from 3 to 6 p.m. at the Second Baptist Church on Broad Rock Boulevard, uh, and also 4 to 7 uh, at Broad Rock Elementary, both of those locations in South Richmond. And on Wednesday from 9 to 1045 at Henrico West and 4 to 7 p.m. at Bellevue Elementary School uh, here uh, as well. On, and also on Thursday, the clinic will operate from 1 to 4.30 at Cary Street. Uh, that's the Cary Street location for the Richmond Health District and 4 to 7 p.m. at Miles Jones Elementary School as well. So after hours at some of our schools, once schools close down, you have opportunities to get uh, vaccinated at two elementary schools uh, in the, or three elementary schools in the city of Richmond, Broad Rock Elementary School, Bellevue Elementary School, and Miles Jones Elementary School as well. Also, I'm sorry, Friday, J.B. Fisher is hosting one. That will be at 4 to 7 p.m. So let me, let, me let me correct that. Four elementary schools in the city of Richmond offer uh, late hours for vaccinations for everyone, but also including our youth uh, here in the city. Now, for testing opportunities, we still ask that you go to 
vdh.virginia.gov uh, to check that out. There will be a testing uh, today at the Fulton Resource Center from 1 to 4 p.m. Uh, by, and that's by appointment only. So if you want to go online and make an appointment at the VDH uh, website, you can do that to uh, have access to the Fulton Resource Center. And there is testing available also at that central hub over at the Richmond Raceway, and that is also by appointment. Now, unfortunately, Dr. Avula can't be with us today, but I am uh, grateful today that we have uh, some great partners with us today. VCU, uh, VCU Health has joined us uh, at our briefing today. Today I'm joined by Dr. Art Kellerman, CEO of the VCU Health System. Uh, he will speak today to the impact uh, of this current surge, uh, the, the impact this current surge has had on the VCU Health System. Uh, you may have seen some of my social media posts recently. Uh, I wanted to just bring some recognition to the fact that our healthcare workers are, have been on the front lines of COVID-19 since the beginning of this pandemic back in March of 2020. Uh, some taking multiple shifts uh, to get through the, the, the caseload that is showing up uh, at the VCU health system and, and also other health systems beyond VCU. Uh, they have been truly the heroes in this process, but also we gotta remember to say thank you. Uh, thank you to them and appreciate them as well. Some of the demoralizing things I've heard coming out uh, of some of the health systems of folks the things they're saying to them uh, have, uh, I'll admit, is beyond me. It's, it's shocking to even think that's occurring uh, here in the city, but it is, and that is the truth. Uh, today we have Dr. Kellerman to talk about what's going on at VCU Health. Dr. Kellerman, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Mayor Stoney, for the opportunity to be here today. VCU, all of us, TVC are grateful for your partnership as we work together to protect the health and well-being of the city and our region. VCU Medical Center, just a block from here, is a leader in Central Virginia's effort to treat victims of COVID-19. Since the pandemic began, we have hospitalized nearly 5,000 people with the ravages of this disease. Last winter, at the peak of the third wave, we had 142 patients on one day, either in our ICUs or in hospital beds. That, up till now, was our peak. Yesterday, we had counts at various points during the day, upwards of 200. That's because of how contagious this variant of COVID is. Now, the large majority of inpatients at VCU Medical Center other hospitals in the Richmond area and around the country are unvaccinated. We do have a number that are having breakthrough infections, but they are typically older patients or people with very fragile health for whom even a breakthrough infection that is modified by the power of their vaccination is still enough to put them in the hospital. So not only are the unvaccinated bearing a great burden for this disease, but those who have fragile health conditions, even doing everything possible to keep themselves healthy, also suffer the consequences. But as Mayor Stoney said, there are two additional challenges right now that make this wave the toughest yet for America's healthcare heroes. First, because Omicron is so much more infectious than Delta or any prior variant, we not only have more patients to take care of, but our own staff, although they're vaccinated, are being taken out of action because they're having breakthrough infections too. Now, the good news is because they're vaccinated, by and large, their illnesses are very mild. Within a few days, they're back in action, but they have to stay off duty for an appropriate period of time to keep their patients safe and to keep the community safe, which means they're lost from a team that's already thin from all of the wear and tear that they've undergone for the last two years. So that's why we and virtually every hospital and nursing home in Virginia is struggling to maintain adequate staff to meet our mission. And that leads to the second major challenge, which is this. You know, when COVID came on the scene, cancer, heart disease, trauma, and other major health threats didn't take a holiday. So we still have to take care of all of those other complex 
life-threatening problems that VCU is famous for without missing a beat, even as we deal with this large number of COVID patients and all the demands that places on the system. And that challenge is compounded now with the same kind of supply chain issues that you're finding when you go to the grocery store to get something. We're short on critical supplies. Right now, today, our entire country is facing the most severe shortage of blood in the last decade. And if you're a major trauma center or do organ transplants or cardiac surgery like VCU Medical Center, that's a big deal as well. That's why I beg every citizen of Richmond, every citizen of this Commonwealth, to step up and join us in the fight against COVID-19. And the best way you can do that is to get vaccinated. If you're not vaccinated, you're not only more likely to get infected, you're more likely to pass that virus on to your family, your friends, people you care about. You're 17 times more likely to be hospitalized and you're 20 times more likely to die from the disease than if you have had the vaccine. So here's a shout out to the nearly 6 million Virginians who have already stepped up and gotten vaccinated from across the state and all walks of life. As tough as things are for Virginia's hospitals right now, they'd be far tougher, but for the choices that so many citizens of the Commonwealth and their children have taken to get vaccinated. Now there's one more thing, and Mayor Stoney touched on this point. Whether you're vaccinated or not, please don't come to the ER with mild symptoms hoping you can get a COVID test. Our ER staff, just like our trauma centers, are going flat out with severely ill and injured patients, life-threatening problems. There are alternates for getting tested, and the mayor mentioned them. So please let ERs do what ERs do, which is to take the most severely ill and injured. Don't use them as testing sites, I beg you. Finally, here's the bottom line. As the mayor said, this is an intensely challenging time for Virginia's hospitals and for healthcare providers across the country. We are being challenged more today than at any prior time in this pandemic from the beginning. And we're doing that after two years of almost nonstop action. I showed up here in the health system in October when the first and second waves, October 20, when the first and second waves were well underway. This has been a part of every day since I've been here, but for my team, they've been at it even longer. I'm in awe of the dedication of VCU's doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, everybody on the team, and everyone across the Commonwealth in our country who's involved in healthcare or public health. They're at the center of this fight. And if you could see them in action, you'd be as grateful as I am. But please remember, they're human too. They got families, they get tired, they get discouraged we can all support them by making smart choices ourselves for our own safety, for the safety of our family, for the health of this great city and the Commonwealth. Please help us so we can help you. As we stand together, we can defeat COVID-19 and get back to the life that we all miss so much. Mayor Stoney, thank you for having me here today. We are one team with you, with this great city in the Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kellerman. And um, you know, Dr. Kellerman runs one of the finest healthcare institutions, not just in the Commonwealth, but here also on the East Coast. Uh, and I think we should heed uh, some of, the, of his remarks that this is, is still a, a serious situation. We're not here to press the panic button or anything of the sort. These are straight facts from the people who understand this the most, and that's our, those who work in the healthcare world, uh, those who work in the medical world, that this is still a, uh, a variant, a disease that can kill you and can kill others. And that means we all have to play our role and roll up our sleeves. Uh, and if you need more information, you know, I'm not here to call out those who choose to be unvaccinated or anything of the sort. If you need more information to make this decision, please reach out to the health department. Please use the hotline 804-205-3501. Use that to answer some of your questions. We want as many people as possible 
to be to be vaccinated. Also, we want less people dying and hospitalized in the city of Richmond. So thank you, Dr. Kelly. Today, I'm also joined by the superintendent of Richmond Public Schools, Jason Cameras. First, uh, let me applaud uh, our superintendent for what he said about maintaining the mask requirement here uh, in Richmond Public Schools. Not only is it the right call uh, for the health and safety of our students and all, also of the staff, but it's also the only way we keep our kids in our classrooms, which we know is vital for uh, their learning. Um, a number of children were not in school um, here in Richmond uh, during the height of the pandemic from March up into the fall of uh, 2021. And we saw uh, what occurred, learning loss. We want to keep our children in their classrooms. And we know that this right here can keep them safe and also keep our staff safe as well. Something as simple as covering your face. And so, Mr. Cameras, thank you for uh, your statements uh, over the weekend um, in light of the executive order from uh, the, uh, from the state. Uh, we know uh, what keeps our kids in the classrooms and I thank you putting our children first above all. So you mind coming over here and uh, uh, taking a couple or, or giving a few remarks and then we'll take some questions after that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good afternoon, everyone. As the mayor said, RPS is maintaining its 100% mask mandate for students, staff, and visitors. As the mayor said, we believe, first and foremost, it is the right thing to do. The science is absolutely clear on this. Masks are safe and effective and are one of the best ways to prevent the transmission of COVID-19. That's number one. Number two, as the mayor noted, our ability to keep our doors open, which is essential to our kids' health, physical and mental, and their learning, is tied to the extent to which we prevent transmission. So masks not only keep people healthy, they will keep our doors open. And third, I believe this position is not only legally allowed, but required by Virginia law. Senate Bill 1303, which was signed into law last year with bipartisan support, states that divisions in Virginia must offer in-person instruction, and in doing so, follow CDC guidelines, and now I will quote, to the maximum extent practicable. That is Virginia law. The CDC is very clear on the need for wearing masks, particularly in school settings. And so if we are to follow the law, which is to follow CDC guidance to the maximum extent practicable, then maintaining the mandate is exactly what we should do under the law. Towards that end, we've also purchased a quarter million KN95 masks for our staff and students. Those are in our schools now, available to anyone who needs one. Finally, let me just say, I want to express my profound gratitude to our staff, our teachers and counselors and principals and social workers, so many folks who are making all of these mitigation strategies work in our schools and keeping the infection rate from within school transmission very low. Most of all, I do want to recognize our nurses. They have each become public health directors over the last two years, and particularly with the Omicron surge, they have done truly heroic work. So on behalf of RPS, on behalf of our students, our families, our staff, I want to say thank you to them extend my deepest appreciation to them, and uh, please all send them your love and good wishes to keep them strong so that we can keep doing the important work that we do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Cameras, and now we'll open it up to questions. Henry, I have a three-part, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Generally, if you give us more uh, about what your thoughts are on it and, and how you guys want to hold the line here in Richmond. 
Well, the question from Henry was about uh, executive order number two issued by Governor Yunkin. My thoughts on, on it. Hey, I stand with uh, Mr. Cameras uh, and Richmond Public Schools on maintaining the uh, requirement uh, of masks in uh, their facilities. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, Mr. Uh, Governor Yunkin and his team need to probably get back around the table uh, and dig a little bit deeper about how state government works here in the Commonwealth. Uh, the General Assembly has already passed uh, a piece of legislation, uh, as uh, Mr. Cameron has cited, and uh, that is the law uh, of this land here in the Commonwealth. And um, uh, I'm glad, uh, I'm happy to see that uh, RPS is following suit. Um, this is not only the right thing to do, but also we know that it is uh, effective in slowing the transmission of COVID-19, particularly the Omicron va uh, variant. So I applaud uh, RPS for purchasing a quarter million uh, uh, KN95s uh, that could be utilized inside uh, these classrooms and inside the facilities. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm standing with every locality, not just Richmond, who will continue to maintain their mask requirement at their districts. Sure, the question was about the test to stay program. What that in essence allows is individuals who are close contacts of those who are infected. Uh, in essence, you've spent a certain amount of time uh, in the vicinity of that person. You're not vaccinated, things of that nature. Uh, previously, you would quarantine for 14 days. That's a lot of time out of school for children and for teachers. And we know in most of those cases, there is not actually infection. The test to stay program works as follows. If I'm a student, I'm a close contact of somebody who was identified as positive. Instead of going home for 14 days, what I would do is take a test every night for five days. Every night that I'm negative, I get to come back to school. We are working with a vendor to do that via a telehealth portal so that a certified nurse will be able to walk the student and family member through the test each night, record the results in a secure uh, HIPAA compliant platform that our nurses will then be able to access and inform the student whether they can come back the next day. Part three. question was uh, roughly how many pay people, staff members, are out with COVID. It literally varies hour to hour. I'd say at its max, we probably had 200 employees that were in isolation at various periods of time. For one point, we actually opened a specific drive-through site for our own employees to just, uh, they didn't have to get an employee health okay. They just literally came through that line, showed their badge, and we did the most advanced test, which is a PCR test, because we wanted our staff to be safe and we always want our patients to be safe. The good news is, keep your fingers crossed, now we have more employees coming off of that isolation period back at work than the number that are going out. And so we hope that we're at a plateau and maybe in a few days, if we maintain that, we may be starting to move in the right direction, but I don't wanna jinx it by saying more than that. Right now we are really at the peak that we've ever been with a staff with two years of combat under their belts. And that's the part that I'm most concerned about. They're everybody, the dedication of these people cannot be possibly described adequately, but everybody's got their limit. And we've certainly seen people who said, I'm just time for me to retire, time for me to move on. And we wanna hang on to every single high performing person we can because they're that good. Thank you. Yes. And you said yesterday it was about 200. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Keith, you can 
again, the question was numbers at the peak of the third wave, which was the biggest last winter at that point. The highest number of inpatients we had in any given day between ICU and regular hospital beds was around 140, 142. The last week or so, we have been anywhere from 180, 185, 195, and a couple of times between both COVID patients, ICU and floor, and of patients who are in isolation pending their test result, we were right at 200. We're down below that today. We're about 184 again. So we're really bouncing, but I'm just glad that for the last week or so, we didn't go to 220, 230, 240. So I'm hopeful again that we are at the peak, but the public can help by making the right choices for themselves. It's too early for anybody to let their guard down, especially with Omicron. Yeah, and with that 200, is, like, what's the cap? What's the sort of like authorized number of beds? We would do whatever it takes to meet the mission for this community for Cohen. We have opened more negative pressure rooms, which are rooms that pull air in and blow it outside, than we ever in history thought we would need. We opened 10 more last week just to accommodate the incoming patients. So what we have avoided, and God willing will continue to avoid, is what some hospitals in some parts of the country have had to do, which is called crisis standards of care. And that's when a hospital literally says, we cannot do everything for every patient that we would normally do. We have to focus our efforts and resources to maximize the most lives we can save. But in doing so, not give everything to everybody. We have not done that. We don't want to do that. We'll do everything we humanly can to avoid it. But this public can help by making smart choices. How close have you guys gotten to that point? We've been close enough that we have dusted off the guidelines and made sure that we were current and made sure that nobody would have to start making that decision at 3 in the morning. That's how close we've been. Um, the question, it was a long question there, Chris, but let me see if I capture it correctly. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor made a statement about the potential for stripping local funding for those who uh, don't comply with the executive order. And what does that mean for the city? What does that mean for RPS as well? Well, first, you know, uh, I was glad to be with the governor uh, at the inauguration this past Saturday, and I saw the inauguration of uh, the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the AG. Uh, the governor stated that he was going to be uh, a, a pro-education governor, a pro-schools governor. Uh, threats of defunding schools doesn't sound like the pro-schools message in which he um, echoed not only in the chamber yesterday, but also uh, on Saturday when he gave his uh, inaugural address. And so to me, there's, there's a conflict there. One thing is rhetoric, and then there are actions instead. I ask people to not pay attention to the rhetoric, but pay more attention to the actions of the administration. Threats of defunding schools when our kids are just back in schools uh, after, this, uh, after the pandemic really did not allow for such is a conflicting message to me. Because what we want from the governor is to to get right with what the laws that are currently on the books. And Mr. Cameras has already cited that, that it requires the school systems to actually comply with the CDC standards uh, as most the most practically that they can. And that's what RPS is doing. That's what a number of districts across the state are doing as well. So before we start talking about budgetary items, let's talk about the law that's currently on the books. And let's talk about the public health of all of our uh, students and the staff that go into these buildings each and every day. Prior to, prioritize that above anything else before we start talking about budgets. If they want to talk about defunding schools, you look, go ahead and ask them that question. Mr. Cameras. 
Well, I think the, the mayor covered that quite well. Um, look, the short story is uh, defunding RPS, cutting state funding to RPS would be devastating. It would be devastating to kids' physical health, to their mental health, and to their academic health. I can't possibly see how uh, that is a good remedy to this situation. I will say, look, every million dollars that is cut from RPS is about a dozen teachers, a dozen social workers, or a dozen counselors. And so these are real people that affect hundreds of students every single day. I know people get lost in budget numbers, but to all the parents out there, think about your child's teacher, your child's counselor, and what it would mean for them to lose that individual in the middle of a pandemic when we are trying to climb out from all of the challenges we experienced over the last two years. I can't think of anything more devastating right now. The question is, do I think family, parents, and children should have a choice on to wear a mask if they're in school? Um, I think I've stated where I stand on this topic, and I, I, I believe that these systems, these school systems should follow, should follow the law, the bipartisan law that was um, passed uh, through the General Assembly, and that calls for the systems to follow the CDC guidance uh, at that moment. That's what I support. And the CDC currently states that schools particularly should mask up uh, in order to continue uh, everyday instruction. Uh, that's exactly what RPS is doing currently, and that's what they will continue to do. And I applaud that. All right, thank you, everyone. Hey, stay healthy and stay happy as well. Thank you.